Okay, folks. So hello, my name is Nate Hastings. I am the membership and development manager for the Chamber Collaborative of Greater Portsmouth. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'll be kind of doing double duty, um, admitting people while also doing this intro. So hopefully we'll keep this uh, keep this going smooth. Um, before we get started, I would like to thank the sponsor for the Power Biz Hour series, which is TD Bank. Thank you so much for your sponsorship. And today we are being led by Brian Bouchard from Shaheen Finney in Portsmouth. He works with the firm's litigation and labor and employment departments. Um, and this is gonna be a very timely session. It's a still developing topic. And so pretty much anybody in, um, in business should have an interest in today. And so I am not gonna keep talking because no one is here for me. We are here for Brian. So Brian, take it away. Wow, what pressure. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Bouchard. I am a labor and employment attorney at Sheehan Finney's office in the great city of Portsmouth. Um, thank you for, for coming here today. Last winter, uh, the Portsmouth uh, had me do uh, another business hour conversation uh, about the vaccine. And at that point, that was really focused on whether or not the vaccine was going to be considered a, a medical inquiry or a medical test under the ADA. And when I was given the presentation, I distinctly remember saying that we'll do this again next year and we'll all be in person. And boy, was I wrong. And boy, has the topic of our conversation uh, changed here to date. Today, we're going to be talking about the OSHA ETS, uh, federal contracts, uh, healthcare industries, religious accommodations, and what to do now. And the first three items in that agenda come from President Biden's path out of the pandemic executive order that I'm sure many people are familiar with now. Before we go too far into the woods here, I do want to say that you know, while I am an attorney, uh, this program is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for legal advice. Uh, these issues are pretty complicated. They're pretty nuanced. If you have questions about anything I say here today, please reach out to an attorney or reach out to me or reach out to someone in my office. Uh, an ounce of prevention is often worth a pound of cure when it comes to compliance issues like this. Because we have a lot to cover here in these, these three schemes, if you will, or, or schedules as part of the President Biden's path out, of the, path out of the pandemic plan, we're going to be focusing very surface level today. We're not going to be going into extreme granular detail as to any of these you know, vaccine mandate regulations. Those of you who, who have attended my presentations before know that I generally try to you know, include some types of questions to engage the audience. Uh, most of the time, they're impossible trick questions that kind of exist for my entertainment only. Uh, but we're not going to be doing that today. Because we have so much to cover, uh, we're just going to be covering really what the OSHA ETS says, what the guidance for federal contractors says, and what the final rule says for the healthcare industries. So as many of you may have heard already, the, the OSHA ETS has been held up in some of the courts. And finally, actually last night, the Biden administration tweeted that, is going to, that it is going to suspend impl implementation of the OSHA ETS until further notice. There isn't anything official about that. This is an unofficial tweet. That said, uh, what we're going to cover here with respect to the OSHA ETS, uh, I still think is going to be important, even though the administration has suspended implementation of the ETS. It doesn't mean that um, once judicial scrutiny is over, um, that that stay will be held in advance uh, for, for very long. In fact, compliance obligations may come quickly, depending on what happens at the Sixth Circuit and what happens at the Supreme Court which we'll talk about as we go. Uh, if you have questions about anything I say today, please put them in the chat. I'm not gonna be able to see them while I'm doing the presentation, but I've reserved 10 minutes at the end to talk about uh, questions that you may have as time permits. With that said, let's get going on to the OSHA ETS. Uh, ETS stands for Emergency Temporary Standard. Uh, it is part of OSHA's statute and effectively allows OSHA to issue what is you know, an emergency mandatory rule um, to address situations of grave danger in the workforce. Uh, and that's important because most of the time when an agency like OSHA issues rules, it has to go through a whole notice and comment period. The rule is then revised and then it's published in the federal registrar. That didn't happen this time. Instead, OSHA came up with this rule and it requires immediate compliance um, or compliance as set forth uh, in the ETS. Um, the rule, or excuse me, the ETS will also function as a notice and comment rule, and, and that's important here because the ETS only lasts for six months. That's the, 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 the limit on OSHA's authority 
here. Uh, however, because the ETS is also functioning as a rule for notice and comment, uh, once the notice and comment period goes forward and completes itself, uh, then the ETS may become a final rule of OSHA that is enforceable like any other regulation. So the ETS, uh, let's talk about coverage. The ETS applies for uh, employers with 100 or more employees and as measured at the corporate level. Uh, it doesn't matter if your business has multiple job sites, multiple locations. If your business has 100 employees or more, you are covered under the ETS. You know, expect some joint employer issues. Uh, you know, if you have a business that has uh, uh, for instance, multiple affiliates, multiple subsidiaries, um, but they all have their own federal identifiable tax number uh, and otherwise operate independently. There may be some questions as to whether all those businesses together form one business with 100 employees or more. Uh, however, I would expect the USDOL to take a very broad view of coverage and to say that even those types of businesses with related affiliates count as, as one, businesses, one business for the purpose of this regulation. As I mentioned, there's no consideration for a location of work, uh, indoor or outside of work. Um, that said, the regulations do say that those people who work exclusively outside may be exempt from the ETS. However, even those people who work exclusively outside count towards the employee threshold. Uh, even those who work exclusively remote, remotely, again, count towards the employee threshold. Any employee, whether part-time or full-time, uh, counts towards the employee threshold. So when is the employee count measured from? Well, it's measured from November 5th, 2021, so uh, this year. If a company has 100 employees or more on the payroll, coverage applies. Uh, if a company, while not initially having 100 employees on its payroll by November 5th of this year, later reaches 100 employee mark, uh, then coverage is going to apply. And there's no change in coverage for subsequent reduction in force. So if you look at this chart that I, I put together, uh, employer one starts off on November 5th having 100 employees, peaks at 120 around January, and then goes back down to just over 100 employees. The ETS is going to apply to employer uh, one throughout. Uh, employer two, it's hard to see on the graph, but it's just under the 100 employee mark uh, as of November 5th of this year. And then it goes up slightly uh, by January to cross the 100 mark. And at that point, the ETS applies to this employer. Employer three is different. It could be, you know, a seasonal operation, for example, maybe a, a ski area. And I guess it's uh, wishful thinking on my part to think that winter is going to be over in March. Um, but let's say that this employer has 40 employees uh, as of November 5th, so the ETS doesn't apply to it. Uh, later, due to the ski season, taking that example again, uh, it goes up to 150 employees. And then by March, it's back down to the 40 threshold. Even though employer three is back down to only having 40 employees by March, it is still going to be covered by the ETS. Essentially, once you hit the 100 employee mark, uh, you are forever covered by the ETS so long as the ETS is still enforceable. So assuming that coverage applies here, let's talk about uh, what companies need to do for compliance purposes. Uh, First thing you have to do is decide on the type of company policy you're going to have under the regulations. And then depending on that policy, you may have to uh, address additional requirements for testing and face coverings. Uh, you need to determine the vaccine status and collect immunization records for all employees. You need to provide COVID information to all employees. You have to provide protocols for quarantining and you have to engage in certain reporting. So the ETS requires, let me just fix my screen here. Uh, the ETS requires that all covered employers develop a written policy. And you have two choices with respect to that policy. One is you can establish a, a policy that says all employees must be vaccinated. Okay, and that's addressed at section 1910.501D of the regulations. Uh, and that is effectively a vaccine mandate. The second policy a company can develop is the one you've probably heard about, is you can say that employees have the option to either be fully vaccinated or to submit weekly testing. 
Uh, those are the only two options that are available to you. And I'll note that with the first choice of policy, you can mix and match a little bit. So if you have a business where you have employees who are customer facing, for example, uh, and you want those employees to be fully vaccinated, no matter what, except for in the cases of uh, a medical or religious accommodation, you can say that all employees who are public facing or company or, or customer facing have to be vaccinated. Everybody else has the option to be fully vaccinated or to submit weekly testing. Uh, that's your choice. It just has to be stated clearly and effectively in the policy. Um, so your policy also has to cover, you know, at a minimum, um, some other obligations. Uh, one is you have to lay out the requirement for vaccination, as I've presented here. Uh, two, you have to say what the uh, applicable exclusions are to vaccination, and that's generally going to be a medical or religious accommodation. Uh, you have to say what is going to be provided for paid time for vaccination and then paid leave for recovering from any effects from the vaccination. Um, you have to provide uh, information on vaccine status, meaning that that information is going to be collected from employees regarding vaccine status. Um, and the policy has to provide um, what's going to happen if an employee tests positive and how that notification system is going to work to the employer. Uh, and finally, the policy, you know, at a minimum, has to address what the disciplinary consequences are for non-compliance with the company's uh, ETS policy. Uh, you should also include what the deadlines are, who the enforcement personnel are, and whom an employee should address their questions to uh, in the event they have any questions. Uh, you know, and obviously, if, if the policy you elect here is not to have everybody 100% uh, uh, vaccinated, uh, the policy will need to address uh, what to do for testing and what to do for facial coverings, uh, which brings us to testing. Uh, so this applies if the company decides to have a mixed policy where employees have uh, the option at least of being fully vaccinated or providing weekly testing. So employees who decline to vaccinate for any reason must test weekly. Uh, test results have to be submitted to the employer and saved by the employer. And uh, employers are not required to pay for the weekly tests, which I'm sure many people are happy to hear about. However, um, there is a regulation in New Hampshire uh, as part of the NHDOL regulations that says no employer shall require an employee or applicant for employment to pay for the cost of a medical examination. Uh, this shall not include examinations, permits, or licenses required by federal law. So a COVID-19 test quite obviously is a medical examination. The question that we've been wrestling with these past couple of weeks now is whether or not testing as prescribed by the ETS is something that is required by federal law. The New Hampshire Department of Labor has not made an official determination about this. I can say, however, that unofficially at least, the NHDOL has said that because testing here is really something that is being prescribed by the employer's policy, albeit one it is required to implement because of the ETS, but because it is being required by the employer policy, it is not something required by federal law. Ergo, employers uh, cannot pass the cost of testing on to employees. Um, there may be future development about that. Uh, we'll have to see. And the question many people are probably asking right now, excuse the highlighter, uh, is what about testing for you know, remote workers? If people are rem working remotely 100%, do they have to be tested? And the, the answer is probably not. Uh, testing is required for every non-vaccinated person who reports to work at least once in a seven day period. So if you're coming into work you know, once a week, you have to be tested. Um, and you must be tested at least once every seven days and provide the test no later than the seventh day from the last test. So it's a rolling cycle. There's no testing for remote workers. However, if a remote worker is going to actually go into the office or go into um, an office like setting, or do anything for the company that is not working from home, you know, i.e. Uh, going to a client site, going to a job site, whatever it is, uh, they have to provide a test within seven days of reporting to work. Uh, curiously here, if someone does test positive for COVID and then they go through the isolation protocol, they are exempt from 
providing any testing for a period of 90 days thereafter. Not really sure uh, how OSHA landed on that, but that's what the ETS says. Also, if an individual declines to vaccinate because of you know, any reason, really, uh, then there are face coverings requirements. So non-vaccinated individuals must wear face coverings when indoors or occupying a vehicle with another employee for work purposes. Uh, you know, face coverings are going to be required except when an employee is alone in a room. That means an actual room. So four walls, a ceiling, and a floor. If a person who is unvaccinated is alone in that room, no mask required. Uh, if the person is at a cubicle, however, mask is required. Uh, the other exemption is if the face covering creates a hazard, uh, think of a machinist, for instance, uh, or if the employee is wearing a respirator and then you know, can't wear a mask, uh, or if the employee is eating and drinking. Uh, I put this uh, graphic in here, not necessarily just to take up space, but as an important reminder as to proper mask wearing. And the, the reminder serves as this purpose as well, because under the ETS, it is the employer's obligation to ensure that non-vaccinated individuals are wearing face coverings properly. Um, and you can be fined for, for essentially having workers not wear the mask properly. Um, let's see here. Also important to note is that OSHA carefully defines what is a face covering and what is not a face covering. Uh, so be sure you review those regulations to make sure that employees are um, using proper face coverings. And as we'll talk about later on, uh, unlike with respect to the federal contractor, uh, there is no face covering requirement uh, for people visiting the office. Also under the ETS, there is no requirement for social distancing, uh, even for unvaccinated employees. And that's not the same for the federal contractor requirements that we'll talk about. So determination of vaccination status, this is what every employer must do. So regardless of the policy selected, covered employers must determine the vaccination status of each employee. Uh, and what you have to do is you have to create a roster of all your employees. So, and then you have to designate on that roster is the person fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, or not vaccinated at all. That roster is going to be confidential, uh, as will be the vaccination records that you collect. All of that information must be kept confidential as a medical record under the ADA. Uh, don't worry the collection of medical records isn't going to make you as an employer or a business um, subject to HIPAA because you're not a provider uh, or if you're not uh, in business with a provider. Uh, importantly, though, you are dealing with medical records and they do have to be kept confidential. What the ETS means by fully vaccinated is two shots of Moderna, uh, two shots of Pfizer or one shot of the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, booster vaccines are not being taken into consideration at this time. One thing to note here is that OSHA can require that employers provide COVID-19 vaccination rosters, uh, testing, testing records, uh, as well as vaccination records uh, by the end of the next business day. So if you imagine if you have a company with you know, 120 employees and you are storing uh, testing records for many employees, you are storing vaccination records for many employees, uh, and you are storing a roster for many employees, uh, you can be required to provide all of that information to OSHA in sometimes less than 36 hours. So having a system in place that accounts for everything and, is, and has everything organized is going to be vital for ETS compliance. So what's an acceptable proof of a vaccination? Well, it's all the ones enumerated here. I'm not going to go into them in detail. Uh, the PowerPoint will be shared, but that's what is acceptable proof for a vaccination. It could be the case that you have an employee who says that he or she lost their vaccination card or isn't able to produce one of the vaccination records enumerated here. If that happens, uh, you can accept an affidavit from the employee. And the affidavit has to do a few things. Uh, one, the employee has to attest to his or her vaccination status. Uh, two, they have to say that they lost their vaccination information and are unable to reproduce it. 
Uh, three, they have to acknowledge that they may be subject to criminal penalties for dissembling about their vaccination status. Uh, so essentially this affidavit has to be signed under the pains and penalties of perjury and an employee can be prosecuted for making false statements as to whether or not he or she is vaccinated. Until a company has acceptable proof of vaccination, an employee cannot be considered fully vaccinated. Now, one thing that may happen here is when a company is collecting vaccination records at, at this stage in the game, um, be warned that you may encounter some employees who previously were, let's just say, not honest about whether or not they were vaccinated. You know, let's say you happen to own a football team. That's, let's say, I don't know, the Green Bay Packers. And let's say your star quarterback um, just happened to say that he was immunized from the vaccine and, in fact, wasn't. Uh, that can create some problems with your employees, particularly if you're a company that had adopted protocols like many had, uh, that vaccinated individuals were not required to wear masks in the office or were not required to um, socially distance while in the office. Uh, so just be aware that that's something you may have to be dealing with uh, as vaccination records come out of the woodwork. Also under the ETS, employers are required to inform each employee in a language and at a literacy level that they understand uh, about the requirements of the ETS. And that's gonna be everything that's included in your policy that we discussed a few slides ago. Uh, COVID vaccine efficacy, safety, and benefits. Uh, don't worry, that's a document that's published by the CDC. That's not something that you have to invent yourself as a business. Uh, 11C retaliation which effectively uh, states that no employee can be discriminated against or retaliated against for reporting a workplace injury or a safety violation, uh, and that employees have rights under OSHA if they believe they have been subject to unlawful retaliation. Uh, and employees have to be informed that there are criminal penalties for providing false statements, documents, and information. Again, this goes back to uh, employees providing you know, inaccurate records. Uh, OSHA wants to make sure that everything is accurate. Reporting obligations. Uh, all companies that are covered uh, by the ETS have an obligation to report COVID-related fatalities within eight hours of learning of them. Uh, and with respect to COVID-related hospitalizations, those have to be reported within 24 hours of learning of them. All these reports have to be made to OSHA. Uh, what qualifies as a COVID-19 fatality is not exactly clear under the regulations, uh, but I would assume that it is some type of fatality associated with COVID-19 complications, not someone with COVID-19 who, you know, unfortunately or regrettably gets into a car accident. Uh, I'll note here that uh, with respect to the policy that companies have to create, that policy has to be disseminated to all employees, uh, but it does not have to be provided to OSHA. Reports of uh, fatalities uh, do, however. And that brings us to quarantining. With testing being prevalent, depending on the type of policy a company uh, enacts, it is likely going to happen that an employee is going to test positive or there's going to be a breakthrough case and a vaccinated employee is going to test positive as well. Uh, for those employees who do test positive, they have to be immediately removed from the workplace until they test negative, complete the CDC isolation guidance, uh, and receive clearance from a licensed physician to return to work. So what's the schedule for compliance for all of this? Well, uh, as of right now, because nothing has been changed yet, it's 30 days from the issuance of the ETS, which is uh, December 5th, 2021. By that date, covered employers must comply with all requirements of the ETS except testing. Testing doesn't start until January 4th, 2022. So what does that mean? Uh, by December 5th, um, unless there's a, an official announcement, uh, companies have to have their adopted policy written and disseminated to employees. They have to collect information about COVID-19 vaccination status and create the roster. And they have to adopt policies regarding uh, mask wearing for non-vaccinated employees and all of the other information that we've talked about, including uh, reporting and quarantining. I will say, however, that in light of 
the administration's recent announcement that it's going to suspend temporarily implementation of the ETS, these deadlines are likely to change. They have not officially changed yet, um, but they're likely to change. When they're gonna change by, I really can't say. So one last thing to cover uh, with the ETS is compensable time for being vaccinated. So employers have to provide a reasonable time for employees to receive their primary vaccine. Uh, and that means four hours paid time at the employee's regular rate of pay. So you have to include you know, commissions, uh, non-discretionary bonuses, and the like. There's a little bit of ambiguity between the regulations and the FAQs. Uh, the FAQs seem to suggest that an employee has to be provided four hours of paid time for each dose of the vaccine, or that is not necessarily stated in the regulations. So that's probably going to be sorted out as well. You cannot require employees to use personal time to receive the vaccine. That said, if an employee decides voluntarily to get vaccinated on Saturday, and that is outside of their regular work time, for example, um, that time is not compensable. The four hours of paid time only applies when an employee is getting vaccinated uh, during during their, their regular working time here. Nor can a company uh, require an employee to use any type of banked PTO or sick leave to get vaccinated. The, the policy purpose here is that OSHA doesn't want employees not to get vaccinated because they're worried about you know, using PTO or using sick time. Um, so they want that provided from the employer upfront. Now, employers are also obligated to provide a reasonable time and paid sick leave to recover from vaccine side effects. Now, reasonable time is what is stated by the regulations. What that means is, is up for debate. What OSHA says in the FAQs is that, generally speaking, uh, employees need about two days to recover from each dose of the vaccine. Uh, and that employers are allowed to put a cap on what qualifies as paid sick leave, has to be stated in their policy, of course, but you can cap it. What OSHA says is that a reasonable cap is going to be two days for recovery. Um, but there is no set duration as to you know, what it's going to take for an employee to recover from the vaccine. Uh, with respect to paid sick leave, uh, an employer can require that the employee use sick leave if they have it uh, for recovery from the vaccine. If they don't have any sick leave available, then it has to be provided by the employer. Um, now, this is important. If the company has both sick leave and vacation leave, the company can only require that the employee use sick leave. The company cannot require that the employee use vacation leave or vacation time to recover from the vaccine. If, however, the company has simply one policy or one category for paid time off, and it's just, let's just call it paid time off, that time can be used uh, to recover from the vaccine. So what is the status of all of this? Well, it's lawsuits, 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 and lawsuits. Uh, as many of you have probably heard, the Fifth Circuit granted a permanent injunction of the ETS uh, earlier this week. And last week, the Fifth Circuit has said that the ETS grossly exceeds OSHA's statutory authority and imposes an undue financial burden on companies. And there was also mentioned that the ETS likely violates the, the Commerce Clause. That has resulted in, or, or all of this has resulted in a multi-district litigation uh, what's, what's effectively happened is there have been challenges to the ETS in every circuit court in the country. And when that happens, uh, the, the clerk of court essentially, and this is literally actually, um, puts all the court, the circuit courts into a bucket and there's a ping pong ball. And then there is a drawing as to determine which circuit court is going to preside over this matter, because otherwise you're going to have, things. you're going to have 11 circuits uh, issuing 11 different opinions. So what happened last night is that the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Ohio won the lottery. Um, and what that means is that the Sixth Circuit can now either affirm the decision or confirm uh, the decision of the Fifth Circuit, 
and enjoin the ETS. It can say that parts of the ETS can go forward, but other parts cannot. Um, there's any number of things that can happen. Ultimately, uh, this is going to be heard by the Supreme Court. I don't know what the Sixth Circuit is going to do. It is one of the more conservative courts in the country. If I was a member of the Biden administration, I would be less than pleased that the Sixth Circuit won the lottery here and for the multi-district litigation. So let's talk about federal contractors. Uh, the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force uh, issued its guidance on September 24th, 2021, and amended its guidance a few weeks ago on November 10th, 2021. And what the guidance says is that select federal contracts and subcontracts will have a clause put into the contract that requires compliance with the guidance promulgated by the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force. Um, so basically what's gonna happen is anyone with a federal contract or subcontract is, is going to have that contract um, amended if it's uh, renewed or any new contract uh, is gonna have this clause in it that requires not only compliance with the guidance, but is going to require downstream subcontracts to also comply with the guidance promulgated by the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force. Uh, it is gonna be the entity's responsibility to ensure contract compliance. So who is considered a federal contractor? Well, that means any primary contractor or subcontractor at any tier who is a party to a covered contract. Covered contract in this instance is defined very, very broadly. Um, one of the other things, it, it basically includes almost every contract with the federal government who's an executive agency. Uh, one of the other things to consider here is, is that any tier language here where my, where my laser pointer is, that is, is broader than I think most people give it credit for. Um, what that means is any qualifying contract supporting the prime contract with the federal government qualifies. So it's not only the federal contractor, it's the subcontractor, the sub subcontractor, the sub sub subcontractor, you know, it's turtles on the way down. Uh, I think you get it. Uh, the only exceptions here are going to be grants, uh, which is good news for a lot of nonprofits in New Hampshire, uh, contracts or contract-like instruments with Indian tribes, uh, contracts or subcontracts whose value is generally less than $250,000, employees who perform work outside of the United States, and subcontracts that are solely for the provision of goods that support an upstream federal contract. I will note, however, that just because a contract falls into one of these exceptions, it doesn't mean that the company is necessarily out of the woods. What the guidance says and what it strongly encourages uh, agencies to do is that even though um, putting the clause into those types of contracts is not required, uh, the, guidance in strongly, the guidance strongly encourages agencies to put a clause in those accepted contracts requiring um, anyone who is contracting with the agency to comply with the guidance. Basically, this is, this is contract law, plain and simple. If the agency puts the clause in your contract, you're contractually bound to comply with it. If the agency doesn't, then you're off the hook. So what is required for a vaccine mandate here? Well, the guidance requires all covered contractor employees to be fully vaccinated. So a covered contractor employee means any full-time or part-time employee of a covered contractor, we discussed what a covered contractor was, or working in connection with a covered contract or working at a covered contract workplace. So a covered contract workplace is a workplace that supports or is working on a federal contract. Uh, what this means is that any employee, regardless of their location, who is supporting a federal contract that is covered or a federal subcontract that is covered is required to vaccinate. It doesn't matter whether the person works alone. It doesn't matter whether the person works remotely. Um, so long as they are mapped to a federal contract or a federal subcontract, they are required to vaccinate save for a medical or religious exemption. Uh, 
fully vaccinated means the same terms we have been talking about previously, two shots of Pfizer, two shots of Moderna, or one shot of the J&J. &J. Again, uh, no discussion of a booster. Proof of vaccination, here's what's allowed. I'm not gonna go into all the details of this. The one thing I would note is that unlike the OSHA ETS, uh, the guidance from the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force does not allow employees to submit any type of affidavit or attestation. Uh, an employee either is able to produce proof of vaccination or a, they are not. Like the ETS, however, um, these documents have to be kept by the employer um, and these documents must be kept confidential. Again, this doesn't trigger any HIPAA requirements uh, for a company that otherwise does not you know, provide any healthcare services or support uh, the administration of healthcare services. Masks and social distancing. Uh, employers who are covered by the guidance must ensure that all employees and visitors uh, to a covered workplace facility comply with CDC policy on masks and social distancing. So what does that mean? Vaccinated individuals must wear masks during periods of high to substantial community transmission as determined by the CDC. Uh, there's actually a website you can go to that shows you all that information. And vaccinated individuals are not required to socially distance regardless of community spread. Unvaccinated individuals, however, must wear a mask and must practice social distancing at all times regardless of community transmission. Uh, there's one thing I, I forgot to note in my prior slide, and that is, unlike the OSHA ETS, the vaccine mandate with respect to uh, employees who are covered by the guidance um, provides no accommodation for testing. And uh, an individual is either vaccinated or they receive an accommodation for a medical condition or a religious observance, belief, or practice. There is no testing out option. One thing to note with this is that even though an employee may be supporting a federal contract while working remotely, as we discussed, that person has to vaccinate. However, the employee's home office doesn't become a federal contract uh, location, meaning that even though the employee is working from home, uh, they are not required if they are unvaccinated uh, to wear a mask at home uh, or to socially distance you know, while at home. The guidance also requires that every covered contractor designate an employee responsible for implementing the guidance and communicating information about workplace safety, basically a COVID czar for the workplace. Um, implementing guidance means collecting vaccination records, ensuring that employees are vaccinated, ensuring that employees are wearing masks properly, ensuring that uh, non-vaccinated employees are socially distancing, um, and monitoring the CDC's website for levels of community transmission. What's the schedule for compliance for all of this? Well, it's, it's layered a little bit. Uh, if you are part, if your business, I guess, is part of a contract that predates October 15th, 2021, you're generally going to be exempt uh, from the guidance, unless that is there is an option exercise or an extension is made to that contract. At the time of the extension, then the so-called clause is going to be added into your contract that's going to require compliance with the safer workforce task force guidance. If you enter into a contract between October 15th of this year and November 13th of this year, uh, the clause must be included in contracts for which there was a solicitation issued prior to October of this year. And after November 14th of this year, the clause is going to be incorporated into any contract uh, that qualifies with an executive agency. Again, as we discussed, however, even though your contract may be accepted, it is possible that the executive agency is still going to incorporate the clause into your new contract. Uh, they have the option, but not the obligation to do so. Vaccination is going to be uh, required by January 18th of 2022. That was extended. It recently was December 8th of this year. And after January 18th of 2022, uh, all covered contractor employees must be vaccinated on the first day of contract performance.
That brings us to medical providers and the interim final rule issued by the United States Department of Health and Human Services. This applies to facilities participating in Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, basically, there's 21 types of you know, providers subject to conditions of participation under those guidelines. This will affect about 76,000 healthcare facilities nationwide uh, and 17 million workers nationwide. And it covers anything from hospitals, to hospices, to federally qualified health centers, long-term care facilities, community mental health centers. Um, there was articles as to whether or not it's gonna actually cover pharmacies or not. Uh, basically, it, it, it's broad. And if you are in the medical field and you have a question as to whether or not the interim rule promulgated by the Department of Health and Human Services, and particularly the CMS arm, applies to you, I strongly encourage you to contact Jason Gregoire and Andrew Isles in my office. Uh, they are healthcare attorneys who are well-versed in all of this uh, and can walk you through those issues uh, very well. The vaccination mandate with respect to the interim rule requires select staff at covered facilities to be fully vaccinated by January 4th, 2022. And by select staff, I mean the definition of staff, which is those who interact with other staff, patients, residents, clients, or PACE program participants. Uh, it includes those who may work off-site as well. Um, really, the only people who don't have to be vaccinated is those people who work 100% remotely and don't interact with anybody associated with the hospital um, or with the, the provider on a routine basis. There is no testing option, much like the guidance from the Safer Worker uh, Federal Tax Force. And of course, medical or religious accommodations uh, still apply. Uh, the vaccine rollout actually has to occur in two phases here. So uh, the first dose has to be administered by December 5th of 2021. And uh, the final dose will have to be administered by January 4th of uh, 2022 to have full compliance. Accommodation process. Uh, unlike the OSHA ETS and the, the guidance, uh, the interim rule has specific guidelines for an accommodation process. It requires covered entities uh, to establish a process for determining whether someone has a medical or religious accommodation request. And if someone is requesting uh, an exemption from the vaccine because of a medical reason, uh, the guidance also, excuse me, the, the interim rule says that first, the covered entity has to confirm the recognized clinical contraindication as to why someone cannot be vaccinated. And second, it has to receive um, a note from a licensed practitioner signed and dated by them as well, um, stating that the person has a recognized clinical contraindication and therefore cannot be vaccinated. Importantly, that doctor's note cannot be signed uh, by the person who is also requesting an accommodation. Uh, accommodation records, like the rest of them we talked about, have to be stored by the employer. Um, and the, the provider uh, or the covered facility here must also develop a process for mitigating transmission and spread of COVID-19 for unvaccinated employees. Uh, that could include things like PPE, reassignment to a different job without any type of patient contact. Uh, I would be careful about uh, what's called vaccine labeling, meaning uh, those people who have declined to vaccinate in a hospital setting uh, receive some type of badge or uh, label on their lapel that says they are not vaccinated. So patients know that they are not vaccinated. That can be considered tagging under the ADA or Title VII, and it could get you into hot water from a discrimination perspective. Acceptable proof. Uh, this is the acceptable proof that is allowed under the interim rule. Uh, like with the guidance, there is no options for an affidavit uh, or an employee to attest that they have been fully vaccinated. This has been, excuse me, the, the interim rule has been subject to lawsuits as well. A group of 10 states have sued seeking to enjoin the interim final rule. Those states include Alaska, Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, 
North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and actually New Hampshire, uh, which frankly I was a, a little surprised at, uh, considering that New Hampshire has a regulation requiring healthcare workers to receive yearly flu vaccines uh, unless they have a medical reason for not being vaccinated uh, or they're requesting a religious accommodation. Uh, the basic claims being brought in that lawsuit uh, is that the interim rule fails to comply with you know, the Administrative Procedures Act and that it's excessively broad. Now that we've discussed all three of these, these rules, which one applies? Well, OSHA's ETS applies, assuming the employee threshold is met, only if the federal contractor rule, the medical provider interim rule, or the healthcare ETS from June uh, do not apply to the entity. So if the federal contractor rule applies, go with that. If the medical provider interim rule applies, go with that. Or if the healthcare ETS rule applies, uh, go with that. Uh, OSHA's ETS then becomes a catch-all. We're going to wrap up here briefly uh, talking about religious accommodations. And I think this is one of the things that people have been talking about um, the most. So Title VII of, excuse me, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act uh, includes what is the, the second obligation for an employer to reasonably accommodate an employee. The first I generally consider to be the ADA. And what it says is that an employer is obligated to reasonably accommodate an employee's pers or prospective employee's religious observation, practice, or belief, unless accommodation would be an undue hardship. Important here is that an undue hardship test is materially different than the undue hardship test under the ADA. Under the ADA, there is an undue hardship uh, if there is a significant or difficult expense to the employer. The test for Title VII is considerably lower. An undue hardship is something that requires something more than a de minimis cost to the employer. So depending on the company's workforce, mode of work, clients they serve, it's possible that no employee would qualify for religious accommodation, uh, although employees may qualify for an accommodation under the ADA. Uh, things you want to consider here are the burden to the business, including uh, the potential spread of the COVID-19 virus uh, across the business. So what does religion mean when we're talking about a religious accommodation? Well, it includes traditionally recognized religions, it also includes beliefs that are new, uncommon, uh, or ones that stray from traditional dogma or doctrine. Atheism is also considered a religious belief. What is not considered a religious belief are social, political, or economic philosophies uh, or personal preferences. Uh, the Joe Rogan podcast, you know, maybe a cult, um, but it certainly does not qualify as any type of uh, religious belief. Uh, if an employee does have a religious belief or practice that, that differs from traditional doctrine, you know, they may be asked to explain what their non-traditional religious beliefs are and include. Accommodation is only required if the employee's belief is sincerely held. Most of the time, there is no reason to question whether or not someone's particular belief is sincerely held. Um, but if you have bona fide doubt, you're allowed to make a limited reasonable inquiry. Circumstances in which a bona fide doubt may be found uh, are when the, the employee has behaved in a manner that's markedly inconsistent with a professed belief. Uh, if a person of you know, Christian, Jewish, or Islamic faith has uh, tattoos or doesn't follow certain customs, you know, that, may be person, that may be a person who may be doing things that are you know, inconsistent with traditional doctrine of that belief. Um, whether the accommodation sought is particularly desirable a benefit that is likely sought for secular reasons. I, I think the vaccine here uh, applies in that situation uh, universally. Um, for many people, they simply do not want to be vaccinated, and uh, they may claim that they have a religious belief because of that. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was hosting a panel uh, for SHRA here in Portsmouth, and we had someone from the EEOC on who told us that religious accommodation cases at the EEOC have increased 300%. Uh, the reason being, 
people don't want to be vaccinated, and sometimes that's for secular reasons. Uh, the other thing to look at is whether the timing of the request renders it suspect. Again, if you implement a vaccine mandate and suddenly um, a person is requesting a vaccine, a, a vaccine accommodation for religious reasons, but they've previously worked on you know, Sunday, for example, or previously worked on the Sabbath, uh, that may give you pause, uh, particularly given the timing and whether or not they've done things that have been you know, previously inconsistent. And finally, you wanna look at whether the employer you know, otherwise has reason to believe that the accommodation is not sought for religious reasons. So if you get a request for an accommodation, you may wanna check the employee's social media outlets, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever you, is public and you can check. Be careful here. Of course, you don't wanna ask the employee for his or her password to check their social media accounts. And you don't wanna befriend, befriend them on social media just to check their social media accounts. It's whatever is public. Um, but that may help you make a determination as to whether or not uh, the person has a sincerely held religious belief. Uh, keep in mind that religious beliefs can evolve over time. You know, just because you know, someone has otherwise done things that are inconsistent with their current professed belief um, doesn't mean that their belief is illegitimate. You know, we are living in trying times. It is not uncommon for people to become more spiritual or more religious in times of crisis. Uh, I would note here that there are landmines everywhere with respect to granting a religious accommodation. For some organizations, really depending on the type of business, how people work together, the population served, some companies may do better legally speaking by saying that you know we, we can't accommodate vaccines for religious accommodations, um, particularly because the threshold for an undue hardship is substantially lower. But you do want to make sure uh, that you do have an undue hardship and the reasons why you may be implementing that type of policy. What are the best practices when dealing with a religious accommodation? Uh, one, consider each request for an accommodation on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no universal um, prescription for dealing with a request for religious accommodation. You should carefully document requests for accommodation and, and the supporting reasons as to why each employee is requesting an accommodation. Likewise, you want to carefully document the reasons for each decision. Why did you grant an accommodation to this person and not another person? Uh, and you want to have those decisions made by the same person or groups of people whose authority on that matter is final. Uh, you don't want someone coming in and pulling rank and granting an accommodation to uh, another employee just because that employee is the friend of a high ranking official. That can create complications. So what do you do now? Uh, first, you wanna determine which regulatory scheme applies, if any, and we've discussed uh, all three of them here today. If none, Establish whether you want vaccine mandates in your workplace. Establish whether you want to encourage or incentivize vaccines. Or establish whether you want vaccines to be optional. Have a position on it one way or the other. Uh, second, you want to review OSHA's protecting workers guidance for general duty compliance. Most people know that OSHA has a general duty compliance, which requires employers to provide a safe workplace for their employees. I think at a minimum that obligates every employer to review OSHA's guidance that it's promulgated throughout the summer and determine which policies from the guidance it wants to adopt and which policies it wants to forgo, but to have reasons for why it is foregoing certain options and certain policies under the protecting workers guidance. If you are covered by the ETS, while I know that everything is being joined by the courts right now, it's being held in abeyance. Uh, OSHA has said that it is going to suspend temporary or temporarily suspend enforcement of the ETS. I would begin preparing for the ETS as if it were to take effect. Uh, at least take preliminary steps. Think through what type of systems you're going to have. If the ETS or parts of the ETS survive judicial scrutiny, it is possible that compliance may come quickly. Uh, the Biden administration really wants shots in the arm. That's that's the name of the game here, and however they can get that is, my guess, however, is the policy they're going to take. If you're a federal contractor, start compliance now, uh, especially uh, collecting vaccination records. And if you're a medical provider subject to the interim, interim rule, uh, start compliance now as well. I know I said I was going to wrap up at uh, 1250, um, but we're about there, and I see that there's three questions in the chat. And let me see if I can go through those quickly and then we'll wrap up. 
Uh, I thought the previous slide indicated the date was uh, 118. This says 114. I'm not sure which one that's talking about, but um, for, for the guidance, and I'll check the slides, but uh, for the guidance uh, issued by the Safer Workforce Task Force, uh, the obligation for employees to be fully vaccinated is now January 18th, 2022, and that was changed recently. Another person asked, uh, does testing need to be witnessed or verified by the employer? Uh, not to my knowledge, does not have to be uh, witnessed or verified. Uh, what does have to happen, though, is that the employer employee who is testing does have to submit those results. And of course, as part of the policy, you're going to let all employees know that making false uh, statements or providing false documents uh, can subject them to criminal penalties. And with that, those are the only two questions we had. So I just want to thank everybody for coming here today. I want to thank the Chamber Collaborative of Greater Portsmouth for hosting this. Uh, and please have a happy, healthy, and safe Thanksgiving. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, this is a great session to get us back into the swing of doing uh, power biz hours. And we're also going to be bringing back our sort of deep dive leadership development series. We'll be seeing more of those in December and into 22. So thank you all very much for joining us. And thank you again, Brian, for this. Appreciate it. And y'all have a good day. <laughs>